Today is Wednesday, April 5th, 2023, and we've come together tonight at the Four Lakes Church of Christ in Madison, Wisconsin to study the book of Genesis. So we're back at the book of Genesis. We've been in this book for several months, covering about a chapter a week, and tonight it's time for us to work our way through Genesis chapter 43. So I want to invite you, if you have a Bible with you, to turn with me to Genesis chapter 43. We'll be there in just a few minutes. But we're very glad that you joined us tonight. We want to invite you to also join us this coming Lord's Day morning in person at 9.30 as we study through Isaiah. And then at 10.30, we are continuing on in our study of the book of Hebrews. And as always, if you have any questions about class tonight, any concerns, anything you want to talk about, any prayer concerns, give me a call or send a text to 608-224-0274. We really want to hear from you or send an email to fourlakeschurch at gmail.com. And we'd love to hear from you in that way as well. If you've not yet subscribed to our YouTube channel, we want to invite you to do that. But tonight we're back to Genesis, so we are in the book of beginnings, and this is written by Moses. We're now looking at the life of Joseph. We've been with Joseph for a number of weeks now. And he's been sold by his brothers into slavery in Egypt. And then through this extended series of very unfortunately, uh, unfortunate seeming events, uh, Joseph has now ended up in charge of the land of Egypt. As a result of interpreting Pharaoh's dreams correctly, Joseph is now responsible for getting the entire nation and really that whole part of the world through seven years of famine. So under his leadership, the nation has saved up these huge stockpiles of grain and they are now selling grain back, not only to their own people, but to the surrounding nations coming to them for grain as well. Well, last week we had 10 of Joseph's brothers show up looking to buy some grain. And you may remember Joseph disguised himself, communicated through a translator, And you might remember he gave them grain, but he accuses them of being spies and basically takes Simeon hostage, demands that if they want to see Simeon ever again, if they ever want to buy more grain, they better come back with their younger brother. And the brothers are terrified, not only of Joseph, not even knowing he's Joseph, but terrified of this guy they think is basically Pharaoh, but they're also probably terrified of dad. Uh, They do not want to deal with dad in this demand to see Benjamin. They know he is the favorite son at this point. Nevertheless, they take the grain back home, and when they unpack it, they are even more terrified to discover that the money they took to Egypt to pay for the grain is still in their packs. And so at this point, it certainly appears uh, that they have stolen this grain, this uh, huge load of grain carried on these donkeys, that they have stolen it from the king of Egypt. So this brings us tonight to Genesis 43. The first paragraph is verses 1 through 10. I know we have different size print here. My goal is to cover this uh, a paragraph at a time, and I believe it's still readable, I think, for most of us, but uh, sometimes if we just have two or three verses in a paragraph, the print is going to be bigger, and if we have uh, uh, more verses, it's going to get a little bit smaller. If we need to, I can divide paragraphs up, but uh, certainly 10 verses is doable for us. So Genesis 43, let's look at verses 1 through 10. Genesis 43, verses 1 through 10. Now the famine was severe in the land, So it came about when they had finished eating the grain which they had brought from Egypt, that their father said to them, Go back, buy us a little food. Judah spoke to him, however, saying, The man solemnly warned us, You shall not see my face unless your brother is with you. If you send our brother with us, we will go down and buy you food. But if you do not send him, we will not go down. For the man said to us, You will not see my face unless your brother is with you. Then Israel said, Why did you treat me so badly? By telling the man whether you still had another brother. But they said, The man questioned particularly about us and our relatives, saying, Is your father still alive? Have you another brother? So we answered his questions. Could we possibly know that he would say, Bring your brother down? Judah said to his father Israel, Send the lad with me, and we will arise and go, that we may live and not die, as well as you and our little ones. I myself will be surety for him. You may hold me responsible for him if I do not bring him back to you and set him before you. Then let me bear the blame before you forever. For if we had not delayed, surely by now we could have returned twice. So after they eat everything they brought back from Egypt, the famine is still severe. It's getting worse. And so Jacob, or Israel, the dad, uh, tells his sons, you guys got to go back. You got to go back to Egypt and get some more food. Now let's remember, Simeon is still there isn't he? It's easy to forget that from one chapter to another, especially if you're not reading it straight through. Uh, But Simeon is still down there in Egypt in prison. 
And I think that tells us something about the favoritism in this family. Yet again, this favoritism that has continued down through now several generations in this family. Instead of sending Benjamin back right away as Joseph had requested and getting Simeon back right away, instead of doing that, um, you know, Jacob apparently puts a greater value on Benjamin than he puts on Simeon. And so dad allows Simeon to rot in jail while they get busy eating the grain. Well, it's kind of sad. Simeon's down there. Okay, amen. Dig in. We got this grain. Let's just get back to life as usual. And so they eat the grain, and now, only now that the grain is gone, do they make the next move. And we're not told how long this is. Um, I'm thinking it's more than just a few days, wouldn't you? Probably more than just a few weeks. Maybe several months have gone by. I don't know. I mean, after all, it's most likely that they had 10 donkeys loaded down with multiple sacks of grain, so it would have taken a while to eat through that much grain. And I'm just making sure we don't forget that they are eating through this grain as their brother Simeon is still being held captive down in Egypt. So Jacob wants him to go back. But, uh, you know, the son reminds his dad, we can't. The man solemnly warned us, you know, you shall not see my face and yes, unless your brother's with me. And so Judah speaks up and gives that reminder, gives the warning. We can't go back. And of course, here at this point, Jacob is mad all over again that his sons must have obviously told this man that they had a younger brother. What were you thinking? It's like us answering the phone today and starting to just give out details about our family. We don't do that, do we? We're, we're, we try to be very, I guess, private or closed, especially when it comes to strangers and sharing this kind of personal information. And so the dad is mad. Why would you do this? And then the sons remind Jacob that, no, this man was very specific. We didn't just spill it, but uh, this man was asking about our relatives. He was asking some very specific questions. It, it's like he knew something. Of course, they're not connecting those dots yet, but uh, this guy was, was very specific in his questions, asking about relatives and whether their father's still alive and how he's doing and whether they have another brother. And, um, and so they answer the guy's questions. He's in a position of authority, so they, just, they spill it. And they have no way of anticipating that, me, that he might have ever asked them to bring the younger brother. They never saw that coming. Well, at this point, uh, Judah speaks up, offers to be a deposit, so to speak, for this mission. If Benjamin doesn't make it back, you can blame me. I will bear the guilt of this. And I'm not sure how that makes this much better to you. Um, I, I don't know what this really means, but uh, Judah's advice is just take my word for it. You can blame me if this all goes terribly. Um, but we need to work quickly. I mean, we could have been to Egypt back and forth several times by now if we haven't been delaying over this thing. And lives are at stake. Our, our little ones are hungry, and we are seriously running out of food here. So let's continue on as they're almost forced into this. This is Genesis 43, verses 11 through 15. Genesis 43, 11 through 15. Then their father Israel said to them, If it must be so, then do this. Take some of the best products of the land in your bags and carry down to the man as a present, a little balm and a little honey, aromatic gum and myrrh, pistachio nuts and almonds. Take double the money in your hand and take back in your hand the money that was returned in the mouth of your sacks. Perhaps it was a mistake. Take your brother also and arise, return to the man, and may God Almighty grant you compassion in the sight of the man so that he will release you to your older brother, uh, to you, your, old, your other brother, and Benjamin. And as for me, if I, have, if I am bereaved of my children, I am bereaved. And so the men took this present, and they took double the money in their hand and Benjamin. Uh, then they arose and went down to Egypt and stood before Joseph. So finally, Israel agrees to send his sons back down to Egypt. However, if they're going back, they need to go with gifts. And so this includes balm. Uh, honey, aromatic gum, myrrh, along with some pistachio nuts and almonds. Uh, I had forgotten that uh, pistachios are mentioned in scripture. Uh, I don't know if you remember that or not, but uh, it's kind of an unusual reference, very specific here, so that's kind of neat. And so some of these items are certainly categorized as food, some are not. Um, but you can't really live off of these things. I mean, some of you may disagree. Maybe you could live off of pistachios, but uh, th this is what they have. They need grain 
And so they take these items down to Egypt as a gift. This is on top of the money. So this is above and beyond. And then their father also insists they head down with double the money. So money to buy grain again this time, but also the money that was sent back with them the first time. And this would hopefully prove that they didn't intentionally steal it the first time. So Israel then sends them off with Benjamin. And he doesn't want to do this. But he sends them with God's blessing, and his prayer is that they make it back with Benjamin and your other brother. Um, I thought it was interesting that he doesn't call Simeon by name. I don't know if you caught that there. Uh, but instead, Simeon is just the other brother. Isn't that kind of weird? You know, come back with Benjamin and Simeon. Seems like what most of us kind of normal people would have said, but I think we get back to the favoritism in this family. Bring back Benjamin and the other guy. Kind of strange there, but at this point, they don't really have a choice. You know, if I am bereaved of my children, I'm bereaved. If they die, they die. I, I, we're going to die right here if we don't have food. And, and that's the alternative, that they just starve to death right there where they are. They have no other options at this point. So uh, the sons all head out for Egypt, and they end up standing before Joseph again. That's kind of the last line in this paragraph. So let's continue on then with Genesis 43, verses 16 through 25. Genesis 43, 16 through 25. When Joseph saw Benjamin with them, he said to his house steward, Bring the men into the house and slay an animal and make ready, for the men are to dine with me at noon. So the man did as Joseph said and brought the men to Joseph's house. Now the men were afraid because they were brought to Joseph's house, and they said, it is because of the money that was returned in our sacks the first time that we are being brought in, that he may seek occasion against us and fall upon us and take us for slaves with our donkeys. So they came near to Joseph's house steward and spoke to him at the entrance of the house and said, Oh, my Lord, we indeed came down the first time to buy food. And it came about when we came to the lodging place that we opened our sacks and behold, each man's money was in the mouth of his sack, our money in full. So we have brought it back in our hand. We have also brought down other money in our hand to buy food. We do not know who put our money in our sacks. He said, be at ease. Do not be afraid. Your God and the God of your father has given you treasure in your sacks. I had your money. Then he brought Simeon out to them. Then the man brought the men into Joseph's house and gave them water and they washed their feet and he gave their donkeys fodder. So they prepared the present for Joseph's coming at noon, for they had heard that they were to eat a meal there. So Joseph then sees his brothers coming along with Benjamin, and he has his house steward, basically his butler. It's kind of interesting. Joseph was the butler. He was the servant, wasn't he, at one time. Now he's in charge. He's got his own house. He has people working for him now. So the, the things have changed. And he has his... Head steward, bring them into the house, kill an animal, we're going to party at noon. Well, the head servant brings them into Joseph's private residence. And notice, you know, they're, they're not understanding all of this. And uh, they're really terrified now. They think this is it. You know, we've been brought here into the inner room here to be held accountable for stealing the money last time. So they think Joseph is about to make them slaves and tank their donkeys and who knows what. And so with this fear in their minds, they talk to the head servant and it's interesting, they don't save this for Joseph. they got to kind of break it to him slowly. So they talk to the guy, and uh, and they explain what happened with the money last time. We didn't do it. You know, we got halfway home. We noticed that the money was there. We didn't steal it. Here it is. You have it back. This is payment for the grain we got a month or two ago. And uh, not only that, but we have more money. So we're bringing payment for food this time. So the servant then puts them at ease, explains that God... Uh, the God of their father has done this. That's interesting, isn't it? Not, you know, Ray or whatever, the sun God or, you know, no, no Egyptian God references here. This is your God has arranged this. And I think that right there should be eye opening. We have this Egyptian, this foreigner explaining to God's chosen people that their God was helping them out here. What an amazing reference. Well, at this point, the head of the house brings out Simeon. These brothers are all reunited. And then the head of the house brings them water, washes their feet, uh, feeds their donkeys. So they're not just surviving at this point. They are being treated well. They are being given the, the royal treatment. And uh, they're now ready for this noon meal. 
and they get this present ready for Joseph. The pistachios and the aromatic gum and the myrrh and, and all this stuff. So let's conclude tonight then with Genesis 43 verses 26 through 34. Genesis 43, 26 through 34. When Joseph came home, they brought into the house to him the present which was in their hand and bowed to the ground before him. Then he asked them about their welfare and said, Is your old father well, of whom you spoke? Is he still alive? They said, Your servant, our father is well, he is still alive. They bowed down in homage. As he lifted his eyes and saw his brother Benjamin, his mother's son, he said, Is this your youngest brother of whom you spoke to me? And he said, May God be gracious to you, my son. Joseph hurried out, for he was deeply stirred over his brother, and he sought a place to weep. And he entered his chamber and wept there. Then he washed his face and came out, and he controlled himself and said, Serve the meal. So they served him by himself, and then by themselves, and the Egyptians who ate with him by themselves, because the Egyptians could not eat bread with the Hebrews, for that is loathsome to the Egyptians. Now they were seated before him, the firstborn according to his birthright, and the youngest according to his youth. And the men looked at one another in astonishment. He took portions to them from his own table, but Benjamin's portion was five times as much as any of theirs. So they feasted and drank freely with him. Joseph gets back. The brothers give him the presents. And then Joseph asked how they're doing. And he specifically, again, asked about their father. You remember, Joseph's mother has already died by this time. But he asked how dad is doing and whether he's still alive. It's kind of interesting. It's kind of a follow-up question from last time. That tells us it's probably more than a few days or a few weeks, doesn't it? You know, is he still alive? Not like he died yesterday, but he's, he's getting kind of a, an update here. And they explain, yes, dad is doing well. And then they bow down before their brother. I think this is the, uh, the third time now in this whole situation, the third time that the brothers bow down to their big or younger brother, Joseph. And uh, exactly as Joseph had dreamed it. And exactly as he had explained to his brothers many years earlier. So he could see this coming. They did not. At this point, Joseph pays special attention to Benjamin. And when he confirms that it's Benjamin, he gives the blessing. May God be gracious to you, my son. He was quite a few years younger. And uh, he, he rushes out of the room at this point, doesn't he? He just, he can't take it. So he breaks down in tears. He's overwhelmed at seeing his little brother, Benjamin, again. He goes out, he weeps, and then he washes up and comes back. He gives the order to serve the meal. And uh, we have a few interesting notes here, don't we? Uh, we find that they are divided uh, three ways. That's one thing that's kind of interesting about this paragraph. So we've got Joseph in charge eating alone. Then we've got the brothers eating by themselves. And then we have the Egyptians eating on their own. You know, for some reason, the Egyptians were completely repulsed by eating with the Hebrews. I don't know, you know, it was how they ate. It was kind of a unclean according to their religion. If it was just gross... If they were worried about getting poisoned, there's no telling. Uh, but for some reason, they just they couldn't eat with uh, with Hebrews. So we got three little groups: Joseph on his own, then the brothers, then the rest of uh, the people in Joseph's house. Uh, the other thing to note here is that when the brothers are seated, they are seated according to their birth order. Now, uh, what I think would have been really cool is if Joseph could have sat himself at the table in the proper order. I think that would have been awesome. Um, but Joseph ate separately, and uh, the brothers are amazed at the seating arrangement. This is not by accident. This does not happen. Uh, like, we have a hard enough time keeping track of this at home. <laughs> uh, you know, so what are the chances that some foreigner just randomly assigns the seats around the table in the order in which they were born? This is basically impossible. And yet, that is the way they were seated at this table. And then the other weird thing is that Benjamin, the youngest, was given a portion five times as much as all the others. You know, normally, the firstborn might get a larger portion. Um, but this is the opposite. That Benjamin is absolutely, clearly favored here, isn't he? And remember, this is a time of famine. So food is scarce. Uh, but here this kid comes in, and he, 
you know, he's got the, the five pieces of chicken or whatever. His, his plate is absolutely loaded down here. And uh, the chapter then closes with the brothers eating and drinking freely together. Apparently, you know, nobody is getting executed today. Nobody's getting sent into slavery. Nobody's donkeys are getting confiscated quite yet at this point. So this is where we leave it tonight. I mean, if I could suggest kind of a, a practical lesson today, I, I would just want us to think back to Joseph or uh, Jacob insisting that they take along those gifts along with the payment of the grain. And, you know, I know this is not the main reason why this text is in the Bible, but I think that we do see some wisdom in what Jacob had them do. And it's just the idea of going above and beyond. And, and that's a principle that is repeated over and over through Scripture. And I wouldn't necessarily think of the honey and the pistachios and the aromatic gum and all that as bribery. But I would think of these as kind of gifts, maybe to soften Joseph's heart. I might compare it to what Jacob himself did with the waves of the gifts you know, the, the waves of uh, animals uh, as he prepared to meet Esau again. Remember, after their many years apart, he kind of broke his people up into, into uh, waves. You know, there is a value in going above and beyond in being nice to people, even when we don't have to do it. Um, and just to illustrate this, I think back to a time when we were building a house down in Janesville and um, the concrete crew showed up one morning to uh, put the front walk in. And my wife made those guys brownies. Um, so they showed up to work and not too long afterward, my wife walked out with a pan of hot brownies and she was just doing what she always does, which is going above and beyond. She was just being nice. She was just being Jesus to those guys. And, um, you know, we noticed, um, that, uh, afterward our, our front walk, it kind of looked a whole lot better than the other front walks <laughs> down the street. Ours had the really cool curve to it. You know, most of the others were kind of plain. Uh, at least that's the way I remember it. But, I, you know, there is a practical value, I'm just saying, to going above and beyond and just being nice to people. Whether we're talking tipping in a restaurant or stopping to help somebody do something or, or whatever it might be. But uh, just being nice to people, treating people as we ourselves would like to be treated. Uh, nevertheless, tonight we've seen God continue to take care of his people. Um, not in a way that they ever could have planned for themselves. This is not them doing this, but God is working providentially behind the scenes to save his people through this famine. And uh, next week, we hope to continue with Genesis chapter 44. But thank you so much for being with us tonight. I hope to see most of you in person this coming Lord's Day morning at 930. Back to the book of Isaiah, and then we'll come back together at 1030 for the worship assembly. But let's close tonight by going to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, thank you so much for allowing us to come to you in prayer through your Son. You are the one and only amazing God, creator of heaven and earth, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You are the God of Joseph as well, the God of Egypt, the great king above all other gods. Thank you, Father, for Jesus. We come to you in his name. Amen.